Welcome back to another episode of the Catholic Buzz Podcast. Thank you for joining us uh, today as uh, we're going to explore a whole bunch of things uh, uh, in relation to our Catholic faith. My name is Father Daniele, and I am joined, as usual, by Josh Sullivan. Hello. Welcome, Josh. Thank you. And Matt Van Milligan. Hello. Welcome to you, Matt. And uh, today is our final episode of season four of the Catholic Buzz, another season has gone by, and so uh, we are uh, going through, like we normally do at the end of a season, all the unanswered questions that have come in through uh, email or through uh, fan mail towards Matt, uh, (laughs) any of those questions that have come in throughout the season. We're going to broach this episode, and we're going to do it in our classic speed round uh, format. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. So, Josh, you are going to be the timekeeper. Yeah. And you have all the questions there Perfect. that uh, we've compiled from things we have not answered. And good luck to the speed round. So, the, the purpose of the speed round obviously is not to give a full uh, fledged answer to every question. We're going to try and hit up as many questions as we can. And the time limit on each of these questions is two minutes. Uh, some questions do require a little bit of longer uh, longer explanations. So what we'll share with you today won't be the end all and be all for these <laughs> questions, but we're certainly going to try our best to do so in two minutes. All right. I all got right. the first question here. So time's on. With priests coming from outside of our country as missionary priests, what should I do if I have trouble understanding him? Hmm. That's a good one. Yeah. there. You know, God bless the priests that come and serve as missionary priests, uh, especially in our diocese, I think we have now more missionary priests than we do like locally grown priests. Yeah, probably. Right. Uh, So, and these priests are coming from uh, Nigeria, uh, from parts of India. I know we have uh, missionary priests uh, from Ivory Coast. Even in Canada, uh, we might have some people with very heavy, thick French accents or Irish accents or those types of things too, right? Like they might have come in from different countries or Polish accents or whatever, right? Yeah. Um, And you do hear this from people. eh? You say, you know, we have this new priest. We love him. He's so kind. And I just have a difficulty understanding him when he speaks, mm -hmm. right? Well, you know, for me, uh, I, (laughs) I grew up... Uh, you know, my father has a thick Italian accent. None of my friends really understood <laughs> what he said uh, to them growing up. Uh, but I, I, I think that uh, it helps to uh, get used to listening. And I also uh, would suggest to people getting to know their priest outside of the pulpit. Agreed. That's what I was thinking. Like chatting with him informally, uh, ha- maybe having him over for dinner, uh, things like that, because I think the more you uh, are around the priest, the mm-hmm. more you will understand uh, him yeah. when he speaks, right? And, you know... Be honest with it, too. Yeah. yeah. I mean, if you're having a problem understanding, say that you're having a problem understanding. It's not necessarily their problem for speaking. It's your problem for understanding. You know, and if you make that clear to them, it's not an insult. It's more just like, I'm having a problem, but I want to hear what you want to say. You know, that, that kind of and thing. And so. that's not a bad idea either, is making it clear that, like, hey... Um, you know, we're having trouble understanding you. The you know the priest is used to speaking fast, like I do. Yeah. Maybe he, maybe he can slow down a little bit or yeah. whatever. Okay, there we go. All right, next question. <laughs> nice sound, <laughs> by the way. <laughs> okay, okay, stop, stop. Okay, start again. Uh, saw your <laughs> <laughs> that right. horn. That's the timer. Okay, saw your episode on uh, Eucharistic miracles. Why don't we teach this more in the church? It would be a big difference with the 70% of non-believing in the Eucharist. So someone's referring to that episode where we were talking about uh, Eucharistic miracles. I think the study that came out said 30% of Catholics believe in the, in true the real presence, presence yeah. the true presence of Jesus in the Eucharist. And then we were looking at different miracles that are happening when, you know, the Eucharist bled or the Eucharist, uh, you know, liquefied. And there's or, real uh, DNA evidence and there's real scientific <clears throat> proof behind it and stuff. Yeah, I think, I mean, this evidence is out there. Why don't people more preach on it? There, are, I think there are a couple things because a lot of times the church takes a back approach in the sense of they would like to prove it beyond a doubt before they call it a miracle. So sometimes these exist for 30, 40 years. Like even one of the ones that we talked about with uh, Pope Francis, but when he was a cardinal, it actually took about five years before the church looked into it as a miracle. And then then it took the time on top of that to kind of confirm uh, that it was a miracle. And so um, from the time of uh, conception, not conception, but the time the miracle happened, I'd say, until the time of it actually being officially declared as a miracle, 
it's old news by that point, and people are like, oh, well, yeah, well, was that really confirmed? Was it not confirmed? So I think what there's there's doubt in the miracles, uh, partially because of how long it takes to confirm all these things. Um, and, some of the miracles that existed for years, yeah. like thousands of years before that, I mean, that's that's another yeah. story. And, and maybe the quick answer is maybe we should place some more emphasis on these because they yeah. are a source of uh, encouragement, um, especially since the context of a lot of these Eucharistic miracles are people doubting the real presence of Jesus and th- th- it becoming Coming manifest. Or, um, but strictly speaking, the, the reason we don't emphasize it more strongly is that it does fall into the category of private revelation and, and private devotion. So um, it's not something that Catholics are obliged to believe in, even if they are approved miracles. Uh, but again, they can be a great source of encouragement. Yeah. Good. Perfect. Good okay. timing. All right, next question. My friend uses crystals and stones for healing energy. Is this legit? <laughs> <clears throat> no, <laughs> it's not uh, <laughs> legitimate. But you know, that's a really good question because uh, lots of people. In fact, last week, uh, I, uh, you know, I had a funeral. Uh, you meet, you know, different types of family at funerals, and someone was telling me about how they're not uh, Catholic, but they're into all these uh, crystal and uh, st- healing stones and all that. Yeah. this type of spirituality, right? And and I think this is actually more popular than we think today. People uh, go to spas where there's healing stones and all these different things, right? That people pay for these treatments and people practice them at home. People put like um, different uh, energy, like salts or whatever in their homes for good energy. And, you know, you can present it however you want, but... You know, these are false spiritualities. Mm-hmm. These are very false spiritualities. They're not based in truth whatsoever. And in fact, you know, kind of flirt with the occult, or the, the new agey type of things, yeah. right? If, and which are condemned by yeah, if, the if, church. If there is any power associated with, with them, it, it's not It's not from God. Um, and I think, like, the, the fact that we're... Um, hardwired for the supernatural. Like we're made mm-hmm. in the image and likeness of God. You can see if if faith or if if um, religion isn't isn't a part of your life, that people would kind of try to fill this vacuum with other types of mythologies, other types of kind of supernatural sources of... Um, but again, so you can see from that perspective that um, people want to fill a void. Um, but again, we, we, don't, we don't see these things as having real or significant. And, and that's the problem with these stones, is that you're putting your... The power doesn't come from God. And so... And, and not that it doesn't come from God, is that you're putting the power in the... In, like, if somebody was healed off of it, God healing them... There are miracles. God has healed people. And uh, yeah, but, but putting the power in the faith of the stone versus putting your putting your faith in God to heal the person, wh- why would you just put it in a stone? Like mm-hmm. if, if, as Christians, we know where the true power comes from, where the only power comes from, and which is God. And so don't don't try to take a, a blinder way around, a beat around the bush. Just go straight to the source and say, hey, God, I want you to heal this person. Yeah, and I, you know, I know the, the timer went, but uh, uh, <laughs> already the third question, and we're ignoring the time, but... Uh, <laughs> well, I, you know, I'm like, amazed we lasted this long. <laughs> <laughs> if you have those stones, you know, people Toss say, them. well, well, I know they're healing stones, but I don't believe they heal. Get rid of them. Yeah, yeah. Get rid of them. Why would you have that? Like, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Next question. Sorry. What happens to your soul when you're in a vegetative state? So this is an interesting question because I I think I can give some background too. One of the uh, questions kind of came up when if you're in a coma... Uh, what happens to your soul? You can't sin. You can't. Are, are you going to he- like if you're going to die anyway? Are you going to heaven? Are you just kind of in a limbo? What, where, what's going on there? And I think that's an interesting question. Mm-hmm. Um, if you're if you pull the plug on someone who's in a vegetative state and they die, are you effectively killing them, or are they never going to be coming back anyways? You know, yeah. like that whole thing. So yeah. Uh, it's, it's worth noting that we, we don't believe in dualism. We don't believe in kind of this like full separation of you know the body and the soul as these distinct things. So if the body is in a vegetative state, that the soul is somehow in stasis or just kind of uh, detached. We believe that that these represent a unity. Um, that so you know until the person dies, the soul is an integral, uh, like an integrated part of of their body. So um, yeah, it, it remains with the body, and we don't actually know. Um, you know, if, if there's any consciousness there, um, whether it's tied to consciousness, but we, we, we believe that the soul is still an integral part of the body um, until death. 
Yeah, and and even more so why someone might be in a vegetative state uh, or someone might be unable, let's say someone who's very uh, incapacitated, you know, uh, like we still reverence the person, they still mm-hmm. have dignity, the soul is there until the time of death. And I think that's very important for people to remember because, you know, as soon as someone loses their purpose or functionality in life or, you know, yeah. they can't contribute to society, it's like, boom. We don't really care about them anymore, but yeah. that's not true. The soul is intact with the body until the time of death. The last thing I'll say is if you really want to go down a rabbit hole, start looking up the scientific experiments about does a soul weigh anything? Because there's some really cool experiments that were done on people that are dying, and all of a sudden they lose a little bit of weight, but there's a whole thing on that. It's kind of cool. That's, that's my problem. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, my soul my is really just heavy. too big. <laughs> <laughs> I knew it. Yeah. <laughs> Um, there's actually, but there is some really cool stuff. Um, I mean, they're like milligrams and stuff that you lose, but it's, it, it like people have actually tried to weigh soul. You had an episode on yoga. What about Tai Chi? I think, uh, really quickly, there's a difference between Tai Chi and yoga and yoga is based on spirituality. Its roots come from that. Tai Chi was based, and I might be a little bit wrong about this. I haven't had a lot of time to research it, but um, based more on war- warfare and a style of fighting and exercise to begin with. And then the spirituality came after uh, and then was tied to it. But I think the same concept would still, like you can do the exercises of yoga and not be doing yoga. But if someone was to see you doing that and uh, assume that you're doing yoga, it would be kind of of that same, like, if, if it causes them to potentially sin, meaning, hey, well, look, father's doing yoga, so yoga must be okay. I'm going to go do yoga. They never asked father. They just saw father uh, participating in a exercise class outside in the park or something. Then it could potentially still cause somebody. So if you know better, then, I mean, can you practice Tai Chi? If it's a fighting style specifically and you're learning martial arts, that's a different kind of mentality than if you're using it as exercise in the park. Yeah. And uh, if someone, yeah. Yeah, and, and even historically, uh, Tai Chi started out as, you would say, kind of a, a more serious martial art. Um, but I think most people's kind of experience of, with it is a lot of times like elderly people in the park doing very slow movements and, <laughs> yeah. and pose it. So like um, uh, you, you could arguably say that a lot of the, um, the, the attached spirituality around Qi energy, vital energy, focusing, those types of – have kind of all – like – um, been removed through process. Uh, but again, in, in, in the same way uh, that we talked about with yoga, that you want to be careful. You want to make sure that you're not, uh, by doing these exercises, by participating in this practice, that you're not um, uh, inviting you know, a, a spirituality that is incompatible with our faith. Perfect. Okay. Uh, I forgot to push the start on that one, so <laughs> I think that's about two minutes. Okay. Oh, there we go. Do bad things happen to me because I sin? This is kind of like the prosperity gospel, I think. Um, A lot of times you have Christian Protestants that talk about um, if you're doing everything right, God is going to reward you with money and material wealth and good things happening and stuff like that. And then even in the Bible, if we look at the Bible, you have um, the Old Testament where it appeared that if the Israelites were doing something wrong, like worshiping a cow, then God would come and punish them. And I'm going to say that God came to change that relationship. Jesus came down to change that relationship with people because he doesn't want to punish you because you sin stuff. What I will say is sometimes in my own personal experience, he has allowed bad things to happen to me so that I turn back to him. Meaning he's not not the one putting (laughs) bad things, you know, he's not trying to hurt me or punish me, but he's been like, yeah, we're going to let him deal with a little bit of strife or stress or something like that. And what I find myself doing is because of the way I was raised is I turn back to him and okay, God, I can't do this anymore. you got to take this off my shoulders. Mm-hmm. And what I'm realizing is, oh, I haven't been doing my prayer time. Oh, Lord, I'm sorry. Oh, and then, and I realize that in the bigger ordeals in my life, I've turned back to him and come closer and closer to him. So God might allow those things to get, draw you closer to him, but you have to recognize those. I, he doesn't go out of his way to try to punish. He's not a Zeus with big lightning bolt. Yeah. And and uh, these types of questions, like you want a, an easy yes or no, but yeah. uh, again, it's, it's more complicated than that. Like, and even, even in the Bible, um, that, you know, uh, justice isn't purely reputative, uh, that it's not just this one-to-one correspondence between I did this bad thing and this is the negative consequence. Certainly, you know, a lot of 
my uh, actions, if they're bad actions, have negative consequences. Um, but again, following on the previous question, you know, it's not karma. There's not this one-to-one correspondence between, you know, the bad thing I do and the, you know, the, the spiritual or even kind of practical consequence. Yeah. And but, I, I will add, though, like uh, you're saying, yes, does God smite us or punish us because we're, we're sinning? No, we don't believe in that, right? But I would also add that we reap what we sow, yeah. Yeah. right? So if if... You know, if we're leading a life that's destructive, right? If we're if we're involved in patterns that are destructive, you know, well, we can't be upset when the result is yeah. destructive, right? So we reap what we sow, and this, and is that God doing that to us? I would say no. Uh, it's, <laughs> it's, it's most of the time it's us doing that to ourselves. Yeah, yeah. I just had to hit this because we're going to. Uh, are you changing our sound? <laughs> well, I, it changed when I when I did it. So here, we're, we're, okay. Well, I don't know if that's going to work. Next question. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Ah, uh, we already kind of answered this, but let's quickly answer it. Isn't being a good person enough? Enough for what? <laughs> for heaven? Uh, for, okay. No. Yeah, yeah. For salvation. <laughs> no. We talked about this last week. If you have an F, uh, you go talk. You need four things that the gospel talks about. You need the bread of life. You need to be baptized with water. You need to be uh, profess it in faith. And one more. I can't remember what it is. Give me a second. <laughs> Prof- Professor of faith, and one what? more. <laughs> Those are the things that come from the gospel that Jesus said, if you want everlasting life, these are the things you need to do, basically, at different times. And so go listen. We talked about it in the last episode. <laughs> remember, the, uh, remember the scripture when the man comes to t- uh, Jesus, oh, yeah. good teacher, and he says, why do you call me good? Yeah. Right? Um, you know, today, that's, <laughs> it's a vague question. Uh, what what is our de- what is our definition of being good, right? Yeah. If you had twenty people in a room and you said, "What does it mean to be good?" I think you'd get twenty different answers, right? Yeah. Uh, because depending on our state in life, depending on what our interests are, depending on what our philanthropies are, whatever, you know. So, is it enough to be good? Well, I think the source of goodness is the Lord, and and this and to be good in its fullest sense is to love the Lord with all our heart. And to serve the Lord with our life, right? So if people are saying, well, he's a nice guy. (laughs) Sure. And that's a welcome thing. Please be nice and and please be respectful and all those things. Is it enough? (laughs) Like like you said, enough for what? Sufficient. Is it it, it sufficient? I don't don't think so. Yeah. And you you could even say that like a path to salvation is pursuit of the good, the true, and the beautiful. But if that is a sincere pursuit, you would expect that to extend not just was my behavior good today or was I, was I, you know, not terrible to my, <laughs> to my family or to my uh, community? You know, you would expect the extension of that to actually look for um, what, what beyond just my good behavior um, would result in salvation. Yeah. yeah. Ultimately to get into heaven, you just need the mercy of God. Yeah. God's already got, God's already paid the price, but yeah. you got to accept it. All right. Next one. How do I share my faith with someone who has fallen away from the church? Specifically, if they've been hurt by so-called leaders of the church, that's a good one. Yeah, it's a it's a good question, you know. And and I think I would hope that this is at the heart of most people's. Um, uh, I I would I would I hope that people most people have this in their heart mm-hmm. to want their friends and their family members who are away from the church to come back to the church to come back to be in relationship with God. It does get. Tricky, muddled when someone, uh, you know, has been hurt. So this question says so-called leaders. I don't know if that's mentioning priests. I don't know if that's mentioning, you know, volunteers at the, at the church, right? So-called leaders. Uh, so, but let's let's look at both, I guess. Uh, you know, there have been people who have been hurt by priests. We know the sexual abuse scandal has uh, hurt many people. Uh, who have been abused, the victims of that, uh, their families, their friends, you know, it has a ripple effect, right? Uh, it, it's hurt parish communities. Mm-hmm. Then there's people who have been hurt by priests just by, you know, uh, <laughs> a comment. H- human or, nature. Uh, yeah, yeah. You know, a, a different style or uh, whatever, you name it. And uh, then there are leaders, so-called leaders <laughs> in the church. You know, these might be the heads of committees or uh, some people who think they have a role in the church, you know, uh, that uh, maybe pull their weight around the church and say, you know, I'm in charge of this, I'm in charge of that. And that could be off-putting for people, 
right? So, you know, you walk into a church, someone says, no, that's my job. Don't, uh, you can't do that or whatever. That could be off-putting. So here we have levels of hurt. People have been away from the church, right? So what do we do? Well, uh, I think there's a number of things we can do, but I think first and foremost, it's really important for the person who has been hurt uh, you know, healing has to take place first before mm-hmm. anything, right? And I truly believe that God heals all wounds, uh, even those inflicted upon by members of the church, right? That God, that God can heal those things. Um, without healing, you know, we carry around that resentment and that hurt. Uh, and th- I'm not saying that it's easy. I'm not saying like, you know, no. by all means, a quick fix or anything like that. But I do think that... Uh, it's, it's hard without healing to just say, hey, why don't you come back to church with me? So maybe the person who you're trying to encourage to come to church, maybe uh, I would start maybe by praying for that person's healing, yeah. inviting them to uh, seek therapy or uh, some sort of healing. Maybe it's through the sacrament of the sick. Uh, if they're not open to that, maybe it's other means that we find healing uh, from wounds uh, maybe, you know, to uh, grow in some types of practice of forgiveness. I, I don't know. But I think that has to happen first. Mm. When, we, when we tell people about the healing power of God, it, it could be life-changing, right? Like, it could be life-changing. The obstacle, though, is that someone representing the Lord or uh, someone who says they represent the Lord has inflicted that pain. So that's where the major obstacle is, right? Praying that God can have that relationship with that. I think God having that relationship with the person back first. And so praying, praying again, like you said, praying for that healing, but then having that relationship with God first. And then that per- once that person has that relationship with God, God can heal them and then bringing them back to the church from there. Because again, they can get the fullness of their faith through the church. Um, but having that little, like, you can you can baptize someone, you can introduce them to God. It doesn't have to be on the steps of a church. It can mm-hmm. be in the, you know, it can be in a living room, it can be in a car, it can be anywhere. Um, but by introducing, um, by introducing them specifically, just again, well, then let's just say a little prayer. Like, let, let's not go to the church thing. Mm-hmm. Let's not make the institution the issue, the issue right. and the problem. Let's let's have a relationship. Let God heal first, and then bring um, back to the sacraments, back to that kind of thing. Does that make sense to you? Yeah. Yes, in order to yeah. bring them back to the community of the church is really important, right? Yeah. Um, but also, I would say too that um, someone who has been hurt by the church, it's it's hard to differentiate mm. between like Jesus and the ch- and and his church, his bride, yeah. the church, and the person who stands as representative of the church. Agreed. And I, I really think that once we differentiate there, once we separate the two, you know, like, uh, I truly believe, you know, the, the, the devil finds his way in all sorts of different ways, you know, and sometimes comes through a leader of the church, sometimes it comes through volunteers, whatever it might be, uh, and we have to recognize that, you know, we are in a spiritual battle, and sometimes that affects yeah. church leadership. And, and that's not a new reality, right. um, that, like, the church has survived Judas, um, and yeah. you know, uh, more than just survived, kind of thrived in the in, in in the early church, despite the the bad behavior of those in leadership. See, seeing the church as a hospital and Jesus yeah. being the only doctor, right? And I think that's the only way. So even the people that hurt you, they have hurt, and that's not again not giving them excuse. I'm yeah. saying more to see it as that they weren't Jesus and and her bride, his bride, sorry, the church, but it was a representation, and that. Even as priests, even as leaders of the church, they're still wounded individuals that are hurt by sin. And, and you know, I know we've gone way over yeah, our time yeah. for this question because you shut off the timer there. But, <laughs> yeah. uh, uh, but for, for the person who's asking, how can I invite someone back or mm-hmm. whatever, however the question was phrased, yeah. uh, I would say, like, don't give up. Mm-hmm. Like, sometimes we just say that person's been hurt by the church. I have no chance. Like, let's keep pray, pray, praying pray, for pray. them. Mm-hmm. Let's Give it to Jesus. Keep, keep inviting them. Yeah. Uh, you know, keep uh, and and uh, like journey with them. Yeah. Like be a companion uh, on the spiritual life with them. I think is really, really, really important. Give it to Jesus. He's he's more powerful than you or I or anybody else. So just mm-hmm. give it to him. Let him take care of it. Uh, keep praying every day that he takes care of it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, next question here. Sorry. 
I have been wanting to begin the annulment process, but have been told it is long and expensive. Is this the case? Well, um, not really. I mean, every case is different, right? So, uh, circumstances. And stuff. Yeah, let's. I'll talk about two. One one was what long length, yeah. and one was expensive. expense. Okay, so let's deal with the expense first because that's pretty easy. Uh, Pope Francis has has made alterations to the process of annulment. Uh, a number of years ago, I forget what year now, uh, but uh, the annulment process is free. So I know years ago, maybe decades ago, people used to say they had to pay for you know people who work in the tribunals. Yeah, now the process is free. Of course, you know someone who's who appreciates the work that people in the tribunals are doing can make a donation, mm-hmm. right? But uh, there's no set fee anymore for um, an annulment. So that's that's done. So no, it's not expensive. Number two is the length. Now this depends on how uh, complicated the situation is, right? And what I mean by that is if someone's seeking an annulment, what happens in the annulment process is there's an investigation, right? There's an inquiry. So the applicant of the annulment has to fill out sort of basic information, then describe like the uh, w- what happened surrounding their wedding, their marriage, their courtship phase, what happened when the marriage started to break down, uh, you know, explain sort of things like that. They have to provide a witness, too, that can corroborate their story. So th- that is quite a process. Some people who are ready to jump into the annulment process, they get it done right away. They go home, they're excited, they fill out this paperwork, <laughs> and within a couple of days, they got their package ready, right? Yeah. Some people... It takes a little time. Mm-hmm. Some people need to sit with the questions. Sometimes it brings up bad memories, right, depending yeah. on the situation. Uh, and so some people need to sit with it. People need to really, you know, pray with it uh, or just, you know, do a little bit here, walk away, do a little bit there, walk away. Uh, so that's part. Of, that's kind of like the first part. Once all that information's compiled now, another <laughs> tricky thing is like uh, – when the investigation happens by the marriage tribunal, right? Um, it could be that one of the one of the uh, one spouse lives far away in a country that's hard to contact or whatever it might be. So that might take some time too. Uh, just contacting all the people that are necessary, right? Uh, you know, it would take faster if everyone lived in the same city or whatever <laughs> it might be, right? Uh, then it also matters how many cases they're dealing with. Yeah. It almost it matters uh, how complicated the thing is. So, a lot know, of factors. Come there's in. a lot of factors. So I can't say how lengthy it will be, but uh, it's not length. Like it's we're not talking years here. You yeah, know, we're talking months okay. to a year. Yeah, perfect. All right. Oh, this is a loaded question, but we're going to try to hit it up anyways. Is it okay to gamble at a casino? Oh. And if it is, when is it okay and when is it not? It's okay to gamble at a casino. <laughs> uh, just first and foremost, it's okay to gamble at a casino as long as it doesn't become dependent and as long as it's not putting you or your family in danger, which is the simple way of answering that question. Yeah. Right? Like if you and your wife are going to the casino with uh, 20 bucks in your pocket, 50 bucks in your pocket, and you can afford that yeah. 20 bucks, 50 bucks, you know, it's not going to prevent your children from eating lunch for the next week. Yeah. Uh, then, you know, that's your source of entertainment. Uh, you know, instead of going to the movies that night, you decided to go try uh, your luck at uh, <laughs> the slots, right? But... When it's becoming a dependent thing, like when when you think like, oh, if I just play one more, I'm gonna win the jackpot. If I'm just gonna, you know, that's that's your your whole focus. It's taking over your whole focus about winning that jackpot. Now you're putting your savings on the line. You're putting your wife or your uh, spouse, your uh, kids on the uh, you know them in jeopardy from your gambling. This is a problem mm-hmm. because it's inflicting damage on uh, on yourself but also those that you are in charge of providing for i think it comes to intent too uh, yeah. what is your intent on going if you're going out for a night like you said entertainment night out enjoy yourself um then yeah and, and you got 20 bucks to spend and you'd rather spend it at the casino rather than the movies and have some fun with a bunch of buddies and whatever or or your wife or whatever yeah that makes sense but if you're if you're if you're doing it with the intent of i could maybe win 
yeah. or I need more money. Well, then if you need more yeah. money and you're trying to win by doing the gambling thing, then maybe you're going into it uh, like maybe you're sitting in the sense of you're envious or you're trying to, you know. Yeah. And, and also being self-aware about your own kind of uh, predispositions that, you know, if, if you, it could be a near occasion for yeah. someone that this could yeah. this could really hook into an aspect of their personality and, and be a destructive behavior for them. Yeah. And if someone wants more info on that, the Catechism of the Catholic Church does mention this, and it's uh, Catechism number 2413. It's paragraph 2413 in the Catechism of the Catholic Church. Okay, we've got three questions left and not a lot of time. Okay. So we're going to try to get this down to a 30-second round. I'm not going to put it on the clock, okay? Okay. But here we go. Uh, Do priests get lonely? Yes and no. Um... (laughs) <laughs> of course, you start a 30-second round with this question. <laughs> okay, how about, I'm going to be quick. Uh, I think there's a difference between being lonely and being alone. I think priests are alone sometimes, uh, uh, but not necessarily lonely. People think like because they live alone that they're lonely. That's not true, right? There's a difference between being lonely and being alone. Now, that being said, are there priests who are lonely? Yeah. Sure there are, but... You know, we create our own misery as well, right? So priests who uh, love being with people, who have friends, who have families that they go visit, uh, who hang out with other priests, who have hobbies, uh, who have other things, you know, they're do, are they lonely? No. But priests who have shut themselves in, have closed themselves off, uh, you know, show up at the church just in time for mass, go back home or whatever it is, you know, could they be lonely? Yes. But... I think the question, like, are priests lonely? Like, because of because their lifestyle. You're, yeah, because you're a priest, you must be lonely. No. No, I reject that. Yeah. Okay. Should a priest be using his cell phone during confession, especially in cases of phones listening in? Okay, so a, a priest using his cell phone in confession, no. Like, <laughs> no. And, and Like you, you know, wouldn't use I one during know, Mass. Well, you would, well <laughs> I've seen that too. Uh, but, uh, you know, like... Some priests will sit in the confessional, and if no one's there, they're scrolling on their cell phone. That's, yeah, no, that's, like, keep it away. Yeah. You don't need to bring your cell phone into the confessional. Um, you know, like, my cell phone is on me, maybe yeah. somewhere in my pocket or something like that. But if no one's at the door, am I scrolling through my phone? Definitely not. I use that time in the confessional to pray. I read the scriptures. I have my little uh, missile with me, and I read the scriptures, or I'll go over, I'll make some notes about a homily or something like that. You know, like, that's my time. I'm not, I'm not like, scrolling through Instagram, and then, like, oh, someone's at the door. Okay, I better put this phone away. No, you know, but <laughs> I don't think it's an appropriate place. Our phone's listening. I'm not a tech tech guru. <laughs> you know, it yeah. happens where you're talking about something that you find an advertisement on your phone or whatever like that. It does happen. You know, so should the phones be listening? Uh, c- could the phones be listening to someone's uh, confession? It's possible. I don't know. Like I said, I'm not a tech guru. That's why keep the phones out of the confessional. Yeah, agreed. Sounds keep good. the phones out. Okay. Why does God had hate Eso? Romans oh. 9, and controversially, why does he favor Jacob? <laughs> That's a 30-second question. Oh, yeah, I know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, okay. Uh, <laughs> the last one. Then. Okay, so so context. Okay, so uh, Jacob and Esau. Uh, Esau is the older brother um, who forsakes his birthright. Um, he trades it to his younger brother for a bowl of bean stew. Yeah. Um, okay, so uh, again, context. We're in the patriarchal period uh, of the Bible. Um, you have Abraham, Isaac, uh, Jacob. Um, and uh, Joseph, um, and the, this is, and, and, and again, the, the whole that whole period is God establishing His covenant through Abraham and His descendants. So that's that's really really important for how we understand uh, Jacob and Esau. So um, the question, you know, why does why does He hate Esau? Um, God doesn't hate Esau um, uh, directly. Esau despises his birthright. So uh, again, in, in that whole generational period, um, it, it, where you would expect primogeniture, the firstborn son inherits the uh, covenant and her inherits the responsibility, but that's not the case for Jacob and Esau. That's not the case for um, Isaac uh, and Ishmael. Um, it's, it's, it's in many cases, and even go back further in Genesis, I know I've already blown my 30 uh, thirty <laughs> second budget, um, but even go back to uh, earlier in Genesis with Adam and Eve, um, the progeny is continued through Seth. Um, which is, born. Yeah. yeah. Um, so uh, again, God is not looking at what humans are looking at. So God is looking for um, passing on 
um, the covenant through those who would honor it. So, um, and uh, if we had time, we would go into the distinction between uh, the birthright and the blessing because uh, Esau actually gives um, Jacob the birthright but he actually deceives his father into acquiring the blessing. And there's uh, a lot of implications there. So uh, all that to say um, that God is, uh, God blesses or God honors um, uh, 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 Jacob uh, and not Esau because Esau despises his birthright, despises his inheritance and rejects it. Um, and uh, God uh, loves uh, Jacob um, because he values the covenant. He values the inheritance. He values the birthright more than Esau, but that's not to say that his deception is without consequence, but that's... A, God's never going to force you into it. Either, that's right? another yeah. and longer discussion, yeah. yeah. Okay, good job. Yeah. Yeah. Are those all the questions? Uh, yeah, it's pretty much that's the whole, the whole thing. Okay, just the in time. first time we got through our... We got through all, the, all, the all those questions. ones that we haven't answered. Yet. All right, well, that's a wrap on season four of the Catholic Buzz, so thank you both for a good season of uh, episodes. We've gone through a lot of topics this uh, season. And uh, thank back you. in the fall, <laughs> yeah, we're back in the fall. Thank you to Dave and Kevin who work behind the scenes of our podcast. Thank yeah. you to all of you who have journeyed with us in season four, listening to our podcast, different episodes, and submitting uh, topics and questions that uh, we got to at least uh, on the final episode of season four. We got to them. So if you have comments uh, that you want to add, you can add them on our social media, or if you have topics for season five of the Catholic Buzz podcast, you can send them to our email at ask us at the Catholic Buzz.com. So for all of us here at the Catholic Buzz Podcast, at the end of season four, thanks for watching and we'll see you next season. <laughs> <laughs>